Hi there, and a very warm welcome to this week's quick tip. So in this week's quick tip, we're going to take a look at Octane gotchas. So those stumbling blocks where newcomers or even seasoned veterans are stumbling upon and find the UI or some features a bit lacking. So we are going to take a look at those and hopefully better your Octane experience. So let's dive right in and get started. All right, let's start this video with an interlude of my future me. So I noticed that we have quite a lot of points here and this video would be very long. So I opted for breaking this apart into sections. And then if this week's videos with all the material gotchas is well received, we can continue with lighting gotchas, scene gotchas, live viewer gotchas, and finally rendering gotchas. Let me know what you think and if you liked it and want to see future videos of the series in the comments down below. Now let's carry on with the actual video. Alright, welcome to 3D land. Let's first tackle materials and everything with it, since this is also the longest part of our list. So let's get started by going to materials and create a glossy material, since we can show multiple values with that. So let's actually make the glossy material a material of our sphere here. And you can see that it's pretty bright. And this comes from the diffuse. So if you look closely, the diffuse is 90%. So it means only 10% of the light's energy is absorbed. And this is a very high value. So what I usually do is to lower that down to 70 to 80%. And this is a much more realistic number for a white material. Next, if we go back to the basic, you can see that the BRDF model here is actually Octane. And most of the industry now uses GGX or even GGX energy preserving. So this is a much more safe bet for you if you want to work within industry standards. By the way, I've made a tutorial that goes way more in depth about BSDFs. You can find it here in the upper right corner popping up right now. Next, still in the same material, you can go to the index here. And the index is actually rather low with 1.3. Now, water would be 1.33, and that's already low. And most non-metal materials have an IOR around 1.5. And basically what this is doing is makes your reflection a little bit stronger. So let's do this, 1.5. And it's a good bet to place the IOR there, because most materials use that. If you want to be real specific, of course, you can go to refractiveindex.info, for example, and search for the specific material you need, and then type in that specific IOR into your material. Next, let's look at a transparent material. So we are going to delete this one here, and then go to the materials, create, and then a specular material, and then assign it again. So first of all, what we have here is again, the index is set to 1.3 and we want to set it to 1.5, same as the material before. If you're watching this channel for a longer time, you have seen me doing this a lot. So let's go into the transmission and actually the transmission is set to 0.9. So also 10% of the light is lost. So in contrast to the diffuse before where we need to lower it, actually we need to increase it here. So let's go with a value of one. And if we need a lower throughput of light through the material, usually the best way to do that is with an absorption, not with the transmission. Another thing with refractive materials is that Octane, when you use the path tracing kernel, does caustics on every refractive material. To avoid that or to gain more render speed, you can go to the common tab and actually go and choose fake shadows. And this speeds up the rendering quite a lot. So right now for me, four GPUs are feeding the live viewer here. This is why the non-fake shadow looks so fast. Now, if you're not going especially for caustics, turning fake shadows on is a safe bet for lowering your render times. Okay, let's go for the SSS light in the next one, since we are talking about SSS in connection with fake shadows. So sometimes you have the SSS turned on and it's incredibly dark and grainy. And right now, so it resolves quite well because we have fake shadows on. But if I turn it off, you can see what I'm talking about, dark and grainy. And this is because now the SSS relying on the caustics to resolve. 
And this needs a lot of compute and also a very high GI clamp to work. Otherwise, it's going to be dark like you see here. So for fast render, fake shadows is your friend, especially with subsurface scattering. The next gotcha in the material section has something to do with anisotropy. I've also made a tutorial about this. You can, as always, see it in the upper right corner right now. So the stumbling block here is that the anisotropy relies on your UVs and not on the octane projection you're using. So let me elaborate. Before I go in here, set this as projection and choose something else than UV, for example, box. And let me make this a little bit smaller so you can see the streaks again. You can see that the anisotropy is not respecting the projection here, but still is relying on the underlying UV sets. Now, let me show you the UV sets here real quick by shift clicking on the UV tag. And you can see now there is a orientation of the anisotropy along the V axis. So this is the orientation. And if you want to change the orientation, you have to change the UVs of the object. Again, for a little bit more information about this, you can watch the whole anisotropy tutorial. Next point, still in the material section. So this is when you convert materials. So let's actually create a metal material here and assign it real quick. And then you decide, well, I don't want to start with a metal material, but with a universal material. And you end up with this. And the reason for this is actually in the metal material, you get your energy from the specular channel, but in the universal material, you get it from the albedo. And for some reason, when you change from a metal to a universal material, the albedo gets a black color. So to get back your metalness result, you have to just increase the albedo in your universal material. Also, if you have colored materials within your nodes, so let's do this real quick with a sort of golden color here. Usually with the, let me go back to a metal material. Usually the color comes from a specular. And with the universal material, that same color needs to come from the albedo. Very often when working with octane materials, your update is not reflected in your material preview. To fix that, you can go to your attributes material preview and double click that. This will generate a new preview for your material thumbnail. If you, however, work with a lot of complex materials and don't want to have updates at all, you can go to Options and then Previews and turn that off altogether. You just have to remember that the latest generated preview is then capped until you turn it on again and thus might not reflect the actual state of your material anymore. The next one, still in the material category, is a very annoying one, at least for me, because I stumble upon it over and over again. So whenever I duplicate materials, then head over to the nodes and change something, the change, despite this new material being active, is actually applied to the old material. This is not what I want. I want the active material to be reflected in the node editor. So the workaround for that is when you duplicate your material, then go to the node editor, hit the get active material, and then apply your changes. And this will then reflect on the newly copied material. Next, a warning rather than a gotcha. So mixed materials, don't do them. They can bite you in the ass in any bigger pipeline because it's a UI nightmare. So you have basically a mixed material where you can link to other materials. And for example, I made a car paint material in linking a base material with a clear coat, for example, and get this nice material here. But the mixed material is deprecated and has very little use right now. So a better way would be to do a blend material. You can even convert your mixed materials in other materials by doing this. And then you get the same material, but all the other materials are contained within. So they are not linked here and those links can't be lost. And this is a much better and more robust solution, at least in most of the cases. Next, just to prove my point, another reason why mixed materials are bad. 
because material stacking doesn't work with it. So right now I have the cow paint material underneath and on top I have this decal that I can move around and place here. So I can do that for example. And this is very nice to produce a lot of decals on surfaces and it supports the usual Cinema 4D material stacking. But if I exchange that with a mix material, you can see even after newly loading the scene that this is not working. And the reason is that this is a mix material. So if I use the blend material instead, that also contains two separate materials that is now working again. So again, don't use mixed materials. Next, this is a very sad message to all my cultured friends of procedural corner grease and edge wear. So if we have a look at this material, we can see that we have some concave and convex edge wear here that is defining some material characteristics. And this is two dirt nodes and you might be surprised that Octane limits its dirt nodes to four per material. So you're very limited in the way you can express yourself with different dirt nodes, four per material to be exact. Small interlude, as I've been told that this number will be raised in the future versions of Octane. I don't know to what number, but at least more than four. Let's carry on. If you're coming to Octane from other renderers, you might be surprised that the gamma function seems to be inverted. So a value of 1 is lighter than a value of 2.2 and a value of 0.4545 is even lighter than that. And this also goes for the color correction. So if I type in a gamma of 2.2, Octane's material gets darker. And this is basically a point of view. So what you're setting here is not the gamma that you want to get out of it, but the gamma you expect to come in. So for this material, when we expect a gamma from 1 to come in, nothing is done and the material is bright. And if we're going to set a gamma of 2.2 to come in, then internally the gamma is equalized to be linear. So that means there's a gamma of 0.4545 applied, so we have the gamma of 2.2 or sRGB linearized. Hopefully now you know you don't fall over that stumbling block. Next, more a tip than a gacha. So I always tell people to not use Cinema 4D shaders inside of Octane. And I get a lot of questions with gradients in it. So basically there is this new gradient generator that you can use inside of Octane. So basically use that instead of the gradient here. And if you want to rotate that gradient here, there's no U and V coordinates. So what you need to do is go and go for a transform or projection and then just rotate the R set axis here. There's a little bit of a gacha here and this is that the gamma here is 2.2 on default. So if you want the gradient to be linear, you have to set this to 1. Also, there's quite some different modes that you can choose for different gradients here. All right, on to the next point. Next, we're going to talk about vertex maps. So in my scene, I have some vertex maps, some concave and convex ones here again to drive my materials. So to bring that into my material, I obviously have to create a vertex map shader here and then link the respective vertex map in here. So when we do that, we can see now the vertex map ended up in the shader. This is a completely fine solution and it's working great until you copy the material independent from the object, then the link gets broken. So rather than to have a linked vertex map, it's much better to have a referenced vertex map. And we can do that with the attribute shader. So let's bring in an attribute shader and it looks roughly the same than the vertex map. So what we can do here is paste in a string and the string is actually the name of the vertex map. And then last but not least, we have to set the type from color to float. Color would be for vertex colors. And then we go and get the same result with the difference that we now don't have a link to break. 
So whenever there is some vertex map on the object the material is assigned to with that name, that definitely works. Last but not least, a little tip about Quixel Bridge. So if you have a material selected here or an asset and export it to Cinema 4D, despite the noodly mess that you can get a little bit better by auto range selected, you can see the displacement is not looking very sharp. And this is because the displacement comes in with a very low resolution and you need to know that to fix it. So for me, I exported an 8K material, so let's go with an 8K resolution in the displacement. If you wait for a couple of seconds, you can see now this is looking a lot better and more detailed. And this concludes our material section and therefore the video for this week. If you're eager for more gachas and want me to make this in a series with light gachas, scene gachas, live viewer gachas and rendering gachas, let me know in the comments. As always, at the end of those videos, I like to thank my Patreons for their very generous support. Thank you very much. I am overjoyed to say we have our second 50 euro subscriber here, which is Leon Studio TV. They actually raised their pledge from 15 to 50 euro. Thank you so much for your tremendous support. It really means a lot to me. Also, a huge thanks to my other 50 euro subscriber, Shields Augustinen, who actually supported me by providing this idea to this video also. So thank you double for that. Also, a huge thank you for my 15 euro subscribers, George Luna, Laon, Marty Kane, part one of two, Raiko, Render King, aka Alessandro Bonchio, Scene CGI, Shamos Johnson, and Yasin Rupp. And if you're still here, thank you very much for your support in watching my videos completely. And with this, we arrived at the end of this week's video, so I say thank you very much and gotcha free rendering. Bye.